Welcome to the Accelerate Church television broadcast. We are so glad that you could join us today. In this episode, Pastor Jeremy is teaching on how to win the fight of faith. We believe this message is going to strengthen, encourage you, and can change your life forever. Let's head in there right now. We started a series uh, a couple weeks ago, and we're going to continue in it today. How to win the fight of faith. There's a lot of people that know the scripture in 1 Timothy 6, verse 12, that we've looked at, to fight the good fight of faith. But just because you know that scripture's in the Bible and just because you might acknowledge that living the life of faith is a fight doesn't mean you know how to win. I've compared it to people that run marathons, and my hat's off to you. If you participate in any marathon, that takes a lot of discipline. you got to change your diet, watch what you drink, right? you got to train for it. But there's a difference in going and participating in a marathon and going and believing you could win the marathon. There's a whole other level of commitment and a lot of other factors we could talk about. Well, when it comes to this Christian walk, there's a whole lot of people that settle for average American Christianity, which is basically you'll take a win in one area and a loss in all the rest. But Jesus... He didn't die halfway, so we shouldn't win halfway. Now, the Holy Spirit wanted me to tell you this. I really believe it on my heart because I changed my notes this morning. I normally don't do that. But this morning I woke up and changed my notes because this was what was on me so strong. It's literally the voice that woke me up. It's an inward voice. I didn't hear an outward voice. The Lord speaks to you in your inner man, your spirit. In a still, small voice many times. But sometimes it feels like a yell. Yeah, when he's trying to catch my attention. And he wanted to catch your attention. And you need to know this. Disobedience is always going to cost you. Because there is no path to victory if you're blatantly, willingly disregarding the Word of God. So if we're going to look at this in this series, How to Win the Fight of Faith, you've got to attack all disobedience in your life. Not because you're legalistic. Not because God is all about do's and don'ts, but because he showed us plainly in his word what to do to bless us and what happens uh, if you want to bring the curse. And a lot of people do what brings the curse and want God to bless them anyway, and it doesn't work that way. Just ask Balaam, who tried that in reverse. He tried to curse what God had blessed, and he couldn't do it. He opened his mouth to curse. He was paid a fat sum of money to curse God's people, and instead he blessed them. And it outraged the people that paid him. But then again, a donkey was more in tune with God than him. I read, reread that story because uh, if you haven't read in the book of Numbers about Balaam, you ought to do that because in the New Testament, two writers bring him up and I think it's the Holy Spirit trying to catch our attention. There's a lot of Balaam-minded Christians in this world. Yeah, but they do it in reverse. They want God to bless what he already cursed in his word. It can't happen. He is God. He changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no shadow of turning in him. Therefore, if you disregard what he says willingly, you know what God says, and you willingly disregard this, there's no path to victory for you. God himself can't make it happen. He always leads you to triumph. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph, right? But if you hold the disobedient path, then you block any way for you to come out of that and win. Let me show you in the Word, because I said, it's not good enough for me to tell you. I feel like the Holy Spirit told me that. There better be some Word that confirms it. And there is. Say it with me. Thank God for the Word. Thank God for the word. Are you thankful for the Word? Yes. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 26. It says, if we sin willfully... After we've received the knowledge of the truth. So this is very specific. Some people have read this and said, well, I'm going to live my life and I'm going to be ignorant. There's a saying, ignorance is bliss. I don't believe that's true. Because the devil always picks on the people with the least amount of knowledge. So you need to know the truth. And if something is the truth, I always ask this, what are you going to do about it? Because the truth is the truth 
red, yellow, black, or white, whatever your skin color, wherever you're from, truth is truth. What are you going to do about it? I, can, I had to come to that in several areas of my life. If it's truth, what am I going to do about it? And I was faced with it at 17 years old. My dad, you heard from him this morning at Deer and Offering, he, he trained me the right way. And he didn't train a rebel. And he knew how to fix it if rebellion showed up. I know. I have some experience to talk about. And he never abused me once. He was a man that loved me with all of his heart, and I knew that. That's why he didn't want me to get into rebellion. That's why he wouldn't permit my attitude towards my mom and calling her a liar. I don't have time to tell you that story. There's only one time in my life I called her a liar, and I learned that day, don't ever call mom a liar. Because mama didn't lie. Amen. Some of you are looking at me like, what? I'm not going to tell the story, though. I'm tempted to. Okay, I'm going to tell it. I had disregarded her words, so she gave me, she said, you're getting a, a spanking, a swat. And they didn't hit me on the legs, on the back. Bib, the Bible teaches spanking. Humanists disagree with it, but then again, humanists have kids that are out of control. The Bible says what the Bible says. Rebellion and foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. You might wonder how I know that scripture. It was printed on the front of the paddle. I learned it well. But the rod will drive it far away. See, I can tell you right now in this culture, people are like, I don't like that. Well, of course you don't. You've been influenced by humanism. But when you're influenced by God, things change. Well, so what happened? Well, she bent me over and didn't give me a very good one. Of course, you know, I guess I was probably eight, nine years old at that time. I don't know my age, 10 max. Surely I wasn't older than that. That'd be real dumb for me to be this stupid. But she bent me over, gave me a swan, she gave me another one. I stood up, notice I didn't cry. I stood up and said, I count that as a lie. You said you're going to give me a swat. You gave me two. And I mean, literally, it's almost like a Hollywood movie in my mind. Of course, I was a kid. But it's like, doo, doo, doo. door kicks open. Here's dad. <laughs> literally, he comes home right then. Right then. And she said, your son just called me a liar. Sufficient to say, I learned that day. Don't call mom a liar. I never called her a liar once since. Because my dad wouldn't put up with willful disobedience and rebellion. He said, you know the truth. The Bible says you honor your father and mother in the Lord. You called your mom a liar? Come here, boy. I didn't want to come here. But I did. And I learned something that day that I still talk about at 44 years old. Don't call your mom a liar. Now, you may sit here and say, well, my mom was a liar. Okay, that's a different scenario, but my mom wasn't. I lied about her say, calling her a liar. Isn't that something? You know the devil never changes his playbook? <laughs> I lied saying she was a liar. You're a liar. She wasn't a liar. I was lying. That's the way the devil still plays. <laughs> so what's the truth? The Bible, the Word of God. This is why I have you say it. Service after service. Thank God for the word. Say it with me one more time. Thank God for the word. If you didn't have the word of God, it's just chaos in life. So after you come to the knowledge and you know what the Bible says to do, okay? And you know that. And you willfully go against that. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. You can stay up to date with everything happening at Accelerate Church by downloading our app. Add events directly to your calendar, receive notifications when services are going live, hear previous sermons preached by Pastor Jeremy, and you can even give right there from your mobile device. The Accelerate Church app has everything you need right there in the palm of your hand. Head over to your app store today and type in Accelerate Church Amarillo to download to your mobile device. Once you know the truth, listen to me carefully, it's dangerous to ignore it. But it's deadly to willfully, voluntarily is what that word means, go against it. You volunteer to go against the truth, it's deadly. I approve this message that was brought to you by the Holy Spirit. Good news. The Lord will give grace, empowerment to those that desire freedom and victory over sin, over the flesh, over the devil, 
Yeah, he'll give grace to you. In fact, Titus says it like this, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness, that means to say no to anything ungodly, and to worldly lust, we should live sober, it's intoxicant free, spiritually and naturally. We should live righteous and godly when we all get to heaven. What does grace actually teach you when sh- grace shows up in your life? It teaches you to say no in this present age, right here, right now. Look at your neighbor say, right now. Right. See, God's grace is available. Why? Because you hear me talk from Hebrews, and that's immediately when your mind, you're like, well, what about God's grace? It's empowerment to say no. It's a teacher that says, don't keep doing that. By the way, it says in verse 13, grace teaches you to keep looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. That means grace teaches you to stay ready for the rapture of the church. There's a difference in his appearing and his second coming. You need to know that. First, Jesus is going to appear in the sky. He's going to call those that are alive and remain in him to be caught up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, to meet him in the air and forever will be with the Lord. But he's coming back seven years later. Why do I say seven years? Because there's a seven-year period of time designated for the Jewish people. And it's earmarked for him for several reasons. One is the years are 360 days, not 365. A lot of people don't know that. I don't want to dive too deep with eschatology in time teaching, but I want you to know this. Daniel prophesied that there would be exactly... Seven weeks of years, 490 years for Israel, for Jerusalem, from the time the the command was given to rebuild the temple until the Messiah comes and puts his foot on Mount Olives. And there's seven years that remain. Somebody said, wow, it's been more than 490 years since Artaxerxes gave that command way back there. Well, you know what? Listen, you're right. It was paused for the church age that no one saw coming. You're living in a time that was a secret. Men of God, and when you study and you read, here's what you can do. When you read, you go back here, read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Micah, Obadiah. You go read these, Zephaniah. You go read Jonah. You read these books, these prophets that I've named to you. They never saw the church age. They prophesied about the second coming. They never prophesied about the church age. They didn't know it. It was a mystery hidden in Christ. In fact, you can read in Acts chapter 1, and you can see that Jesus' disciples weren't even tracking with the church age when Jesus rose up from the grave. Because they said, now will you restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they weren't even looking at what was about to happen. They didn't know about the church age. Even though Jesus had said a few days before that, I'm building my church. They were like, oh, I guess that's us, the called out ones. Okay, because at the time they went to the temple. This is just, see, you step in here, this is like Bible school. A lot of people don't understand what's really going on. But you're in a time called the last days that kicked off on the day of Pentecost after Jesus went to heaven and he told his disciples there that day, he said, hey, the times and seasons the Lord has in his hands, you go wait for the promise I told you about. He was raptured, went to heaven. Two angels showed up and said, what are you doing here? Go obey what he said. Because how you saw him leave, he's coming again. They thought in their day. That was almost 2,000 years ago. What they failed to see is the day with the Lord is as a 1,000 years. A 1,000 years is as a day, though I'm quoting one of the men that was standing there that day, Peter, who inspired by the Holy Spirit wrote that. What am I saying to you? Creation reveals the future. The seventh day God rested. The 7,000th year of human history, Jesus is going to rule and reign here on earth. You and I should rule and reign with him. But we've got to be faithful right now when we're on this side of it. The day of Pentecost kicked off the last days. I liked it. Jesus told Herod. He said to him, go tell that fox that today and tomorrow I'm going to do my, I'm paraphrasing, I'm going to do my work. Third day I'll be perfected. Even in Jesus' burial and resurrection, you see a prophecy about him coming again. About 2,000 years he designated the church to be on planet earth. Folks, we're at the end. You say, well, hold on, hold on. It's 2023. I know 
man gets involved and has changed the way we, we keep up with time. So people have lost track of God's timetable. Somebody said, well, it's the Jewish thing. No, they lost track of it too. Here's what I want to tell you. We're past seeing signs of the end. We're seeing signals. If you get on I-27 Drive South, you're going to see a sign. It says Lubbock. That's one right, just right here, right outside, 115 miles, I think it says. So that's a sign. You're closer than if you were up in Michigan to Lubbock, right? And as you drive, you get closer, you see, oh, wait, uh, I'm seeing now a sign for a place called Happy. I might as well smile. And then there's Tulia. And then there's Plainview, the, the hometown of my wife, praise God. Yeah, I like Plainview just because of that reason. You may not like it. I like it. But you, you get to Plainview, and just on the other side of Plainview, there's another sign. Now, this is not the first one. This is not the second one. This is at least the third or fourth one. It says Lubbock, 56 miles. But you keep driving on that, and pretty soon you look off the side of the interstate, and you're going to see a red light right on the outskirts of town by where the airport is. You say, I'm seeing red lights. I'm seeing signals of Lubbock. That's how it is with the rapture. We've blown past seeing all the signs. Now we're seeing signals. My friend, you better shake yourself, and you better get ready. Jesus is coming. This is grace talking to you now. See, grace isn't a cover-all for sin. It teaches you to say no. Why? The king is coming. This is what I call straight grace. Straight grace. Everybody say straight grace. It's not twisted. Grace that's presented to you any other way is twisted. And another word for wicked is twisted. The enemy, it's been known now for a while, was going to do this through grace. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, since he wasn't conceived by the Holy Spirit, born to Joseph and Mary, wrote in his book, Jude, you can find it at the end. Judah was actually his name, but Jude is what we call him. He said, I wanted to write to you about your common salvation, but I had to write to you about something else. You gotta earnestly, passionately contend for the faith. For men have come in unaware to many to the church and changed the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Changed it. And I'm telling you, this is a real and present danger. This isn't new. This has been going on for 30 years in the church. Now, not this church, not Kingdom Keys. I've watched Pastor Ricky guard the airwaves. When people get into extreme grace, why? It's dangerous to believe that grace is just a cover-off for your sin. Grace teaches you to say no. Not to say, it's okay, darling. Now, if you repent, you need to stop crying. You need to move on. You've repented. But there's the big difference. And that's what most people don't know about. If you don't repent, then grace can't get to you and empower you to say no. Because you're still saying yes until you repent. See, saying no is repenting. On the second and fourth Sunday nights of every month, we have LifeLinks. We gather together with like-minded believers and discuss the current series that Pastor Jeremy is preaching. We have food, we laugh together, we pray together, and we build those godly relationships with our brothers and sisters within the church. We would love for you to join us for LifeLinks. You can find a list of all of our groups along with their locations on our app, our website, or just stop by the desk in the lobby. We have someone there ready to help you find the perfect LifeLink group. The difference in winning and losing the fight of faith is found in executing the fundamentals of Christianity, the thing that people aren't really looking for. You know... Do you spend time in the Bible every day? Do you spend time praising and worshiping God on your own? Do you spend time praying? Have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost? And do you pray in other tongues every day? You need to. Because if you'll do that, then your spirit will be in tune with the voice of the Holy Spirit. But see, doing those things gets mundane because people don't necessarily see you doing that. Right? Right? So people say, oh, yeah, I'm looking for a real move of God. And they miss what God's doing right here in our midst. They miss it. Well, we started looking at some of the fundamentals on Wednesday night. 
And number one I want to look at is keep your mind renewed, Romans 12. It's called reasonable service. Everybody say reasonable service. service. You don't win a Purple Heart award in heaven for keeping your mind renewed. This is like part of saying, Jesus, I surrender to you. It's after the tears are dried up, after the goosebumps are gone, when maybe you leave and you get angry. What do you got to do then? You got to keep your mind renewed. You got to cut off the supply chain of the enemy. That's his thoughts. That's his devices. Remember that. So what do we do? I'm reviewing now. If you didn't notice, we identify every thought and we take every unrenewed thought captive. We trap it. Amen. So some examples are where we started looking at this, where many Christians think unrenewed and they don't know it. We're going to look at some of these today and I think this is going to help you out. Amen. A, reigning in life over sin. Yes, we looked at this Wednesday night. According to Romans chapter 5, you're to reign in life through what Jesus gave you you got to receive the abundance of grace, the abundance of empowerment. So see, you got to receive an abundance of, no, I'm not living no, uh, ungodly. No, I'm not doing what the world wants me to lust for. No, I'm not doing that. Yes, I'm living sober. I'm living righteous. I'm living holy right here, right now. If you receive an abundance of that, you start reigning, ruling as a king over sin. Folks, I don't have to go too much deeper than that to let you know a lot of people sit in church and they have heard this over and over and over, so they repeat it. I sin every day in word, thought, and deed. You can't help but sin. Folks, that's not ruling as a king over sin. That's sin ruling over you. Jesus did not die on the cross and rise again for you to be dominated in life. Sin shall not have dominion over you. That's Romans Also, chapter 6, anyone who's made Jesus the Lord of their life is no longer a victim. That's what this means. So if you ever struggle once more with a thought, well, you've got it bad. People are treating you bad. They're doing you bad. Identify that as an unrenewed thought. And quick, see, you've got to do this. This is your reasonable service for you to say, wait a minute, wait, wait. That's an unrenewed thought. I've got to capture that. With what? With what the Bible says. I'm more than a conqueror in everything I face. So he says, that's arrogant. No, it's Romans 8. It's not arrogance for you to speak the word. But see, you've got to know the Bible if you're going to rule in life. Anyone that's made Jesus the Lord of their life, they're not a victim. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not a victim. That leads me to a second area where a lot of people are unrenewed and they don't realize it that are Christians. Here it is, B, stay under the lordship of Jesus. This is where we left off Wednesday night. You don't own yourself. Now, any thought contrary to this, you have to capture. Well, I can do what I want. I don't know who that preacher thinks he is. It ain't about who the preacher thinks he is. You're you're listening to the lie of the devil right there off the bat. You should know that. Okay? It's not about who I think I am. It's not about who you think you are. It's who Jesus is. He is the Lord. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's not a Lord or a king. He's the king. He's the Lord. You got that? Now, if you don't put yourself under his lordship, it's called submission, then he's not your Lord no matter what you say. But once you do that, then you realize now he pulls my strings. If you were at the Valentine's banquet the other night, you saw my older brother Clarence. He's a dummy. Literally, a dummy. He's a ventriloquial figure. And the only way he has any life is when Pastor Ricky pulls his strings. I'll tell you, it can kind of creep you out to see those eyes look around. He knows that, he used to let me play with that a little bit. I didn't know what ventriloquism was, by the way. That was a fancy word. That was beyond my education. Yeah. One year, I was going to, sign up for convention, and uh, the teacher said, hey, Jeremy, have you ever thought about ventriloquism? Because he knew, you know, about Clarence. And I said, in all seriousness, I looked around him, I said, Brother Griffin, I can't sing. (laughs) Now, class is supposed to be, you know, a quieter place. He literally lost control. 
turned beet red laughing. I mean laughing and laughing and laughing. He said, because he realized I had no clue what ventriloquism was. He said, it ain't singing. You get Clarence out. You could pull the strings. You do. I was like, oh, <laughs> whoops. Here I was raised in a home with an older brother that's a ventriloquial figure, and I didn't even know what it meant. There's a lot of people raised in God's house that don't even know what God means in his word. You didn't see me coming on that when I snuck up the back way there. You've got to stay under the lordship of Jesus. You've got to keep this mindset. I don't own myself. Let's look at some scripture because I can tell some of you are barely hanging on by the skin of your teeth. Like, I don't know if I believe that, what the Bible says. Thank God for the word, 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Do you not know? Now, I have found as I study that when I see in the Bible, do you not know that the devil makes sure there's a group of people that don't know the answer to this. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who, whom you have from God, and you're not your own? So get this. Here's the point. Don't you know you're not your own? You're not your own. That might be revelation to you right there. But it's in your Bible. I don't have a trick Bible I'm putting up here. It says New King James, but it's not a trick Bible. You are not your own. I want you to say that with me. One, two, three. You are not your own. Look at your neighbor and say it. You are not your own. Look at him and say it like you mean it. You are not your own. You're not your own. You're not. You're not. So, see, when you say, well, I don't like this sermon. I don't like this. You've already shown these before. I don't like all this. Hey, this isn't for you. This is the Lord wanting to talk to you. Your owner. He's got something that he wants to get across to you. And you got to keep things in proper order and understand this is about him, not about you. <laughs> Just smile real big. At least make me think you're receiving this. Verse 20. For you were bought with a price. And what a price. I've already talked about it a couple of times. Therefore glorify God in your body. And in your spirit, which are God's. So if it's not going to glorify God, you don't have permission to do it. If it doesn't bring glory to God, you don't have permission to do it, no matter how you feel about it. Well, unfortunately, we do have to stop right there. We are out of time today. However, if you would like to hear more from this series on how to win the fight of faith, you can head over to our website at AccelerateChurch.cc and click on the media tab. There you will find this message in its entirety, plus so many more that you can listen to throughout your week. But if you are in the Amarillo area, we would love to meet you in person. We're located at 4400 South Crockett Street here in Amarillo, and our service times are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Or you can write us, email us, we would love to hear from you. If we don't see you in person, we'll catch you on the next Accelerate Church television broadcast.